Hello, everybody. Welcome to this service of worship and prayer and praise from Messiah Lutheran Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia. My name is Pastor Ryan Radke, and we're very glad that you're with us today. I'm joined here today by Debbie Walker, our illustrious accompanist who will be uh, accompanying our songs today. And uh, we're glad that you're here. Thanks for watching. We've got a few Lenten announcements to share with you today. Uh, we have three different Lenten things going on right now besides these worship services for our Sundays. We have a Lenten book study going on called Life Together Apart, based on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. Uh, what does it have to teach us about being community in Christ, especially now and especially as we hopefully will be gathering together again soon? What, what do we want to do going forward as we celebrate the chance to be together again? Uh, we've gotten through two chapters so far. This next week is chapter three, as you could have guessed, and um, we're learning about what it means to be in community and how that community is in Christ and through Christ. Uh, also during this season of Lent, uh, we are collecting, encouraging and offering a special offering to Camp uh, Caroline Furnace. Um, they're one of the areas, one of the types of ministries hardest affected by this pandemic and shutdown uh, because you can't have campers and that's what they do. And they've adapted marvelously in doing things online, but. Uh, if you are able to give a little extra as part of your Lenten discipline, please consider uh, marking that for Camp uh, Caroline Furnace or just say Lenten offering on your checks that you mail in, drop off here in the parking lots on Sundays or on your electronic transfers. Uh, third thing, and I got to find it. It seems to have disappeared. Um, where to go? Well, we're doing, there it is. We are doing a an ecumenical Lenten services. Uh, typically, our partners, All Souls Episcopal Church, and ourselves here at Messiah in the past have uh, collaborated on Wednesday night uh, times of Lenten worship and soup suppers. Can't do that this year. Uh, so our two congregations and three others from the area are working together to contribute a video per week on the theme of calmed waters and stilled storms when Jesus meets chaos. So as each of us have all been in our little boats isolated from each other in the middle of stormy waters this last year, uh, what do the stories of Jesus calming the storms and Jesus uh, calming the sea have to teach us uh, right now? So that's what we are talking about uh, in those videos. And the second one has been posted. So please check that out too. Everything you need for these announcements and for our worship service are in the bulletin included in the mailing if you're on our mailing list or they're one tab over on our website uh, from where you're watching this video right now. So if you need to grab one, please pause, go get it so that you can follow along and please read all the other announcements that are in there. Again, welcome. And we begin our time of worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Our gathering song is called God is Here. God is here as we, your people, meet to offer praise and prayer. May we find in fuller measure what it is in Christ we share, here as in the world around us, all our varied skills and arts, wait the coming of the Spirit into open minds and hearts. Here our 
us in both to remind us of our lifelong need of grace. Hear our table, font and pulpit, hear the cross has central place. Hear in honesty of preaching, hear in silence as in speech, hear in newness and renewal, God the Spirit comes to me. Here our children find a welcome in the shepherd's flock and food. Here as bread and wine are taken, Christ sustains us as a food. Here the servants of the servant seek in worship to explore what it means in daily living to believe and to adore. Lord of all of church and kingdom, in an age of change and doubt, Keep us faithful to the gospel. Help us work your purpose out. Here in this day's dedication, all we have to give receive. We who cannot live without you, we adore you. We the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace, and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson today comes from, Gen from Exodus chapter 20. After escaping from slavery, the Israelites come to Mount Sinai, where God teaches them how to live in community. The Ten Commandments proclaim that God alone is worthy of worship. Flowing from God, the life of the community flourishes when based on honesty, trust, fidelity, and respect for life, family, and property. A reading from Exodus. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is under the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The second lesson comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1. The word of the cross is pure foolishness and nonsense to the world, because it claims that God is mostly revealed in weakness, humiliation, and death. But through such divine foolishness and weakness, God is working to save us. The center of Paul's preaching is Christ crucified. A reading from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading comes from St. John, the second chapter. Jesus attacks the commercialization of religion by driving merchants out of the temple. When challenged, he responds mysteriously with the first prediction of his own death and resurrection. In the midst of a seemingly stable religious center, Jesus suggests that the center itself has changed. The Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jewish leaders then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish leaders then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. A couple of years ago, I led a Bible study on the book of Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus. I, I threw it out there as an option because Leviticus is a book everyone seems to refer to, but usually negatively. Leviticus is the book with all the purity laws, the food laws, the relationship laws, the leprosy laws. You really learn a lot about how God wanted the Israelites to handle skin conditions. Folks write the book off as the prime example of why Christians shouldn't be concerned with the Old Testament laws. Folks use this book as a cautionary tale for what is or isn't considered an abomination. It's a book that seems to either be used to exclude certain people or that certain people seem to think should be excluded. So I figured let's actually read it together. Folks said, sure. You know, let's see what's actually in there and, and talk about it and learn from it. And we did. And some of it was just as weird as expected. Some of it was disturbing. We were surprised to find how many rituals and practices prescribed by Leviticus were still a part of or paralleled in our practices of worship and offering today. It helped us make sense of some of the things that Jesus did. And it also contains some moments of grace among all the laws. There is a long section on sacrifices. There are different types of sacrifices for different occasions. 
uh, grain and oil offerings, incense, various animals that would be slaughtered and prepared in special ways to make thank offerings, guilt offerings, sin offerings, and more. The guilt offerings and sin offerings were offered up to God to offset transgressions, to make atonement for the regular sinning, known and unknown, that broke God's laws for the people. The priests would receive and prepare the offerings and burn them on the altar, and the smoke would be a pleasing dedication to God. But let's say your family was poor. Maybe you couldn't afford the sheep or especially the bull that was supposed to be offered up for fill in the blank. The Leviticus system made allowances for that. If you couldn't afford a sheep, you could bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. If you couldn't afford the birds, you could bring choice flour with aromatic incense on it. This sheds a new light, for instance, on Mary and Joseph offering two doves at Jesus's dedication, since Leviticus 12 says the offering should be a lamb, unless that is, you couldn't afford that. There's a reason that there were folks at the great temple in Jerusalem selling cattle and sheep and doves so that everyone could make the sacrifices they were required to, to make things right with God. There's a reason why there were money changers there too, to make sure that the Jews making the pilgrimage to the temple from other places with other kinds of coins could still secure their sacrifices and make things right with God. The laws laid out by God in Leviticus about sacrifices made sure that everyone could have a way to participate. Everyone could have a way to make a visible, tangible sacrifice to offset their sins and make things right with God. That was how the system was intended to work back in the wilderness wandering days and in the early days of the promised land, long before the first temple was built and destroyed, and long before the second temple was built, the one that Jesus encountered in our gospel today. That's how all the laws, really, from the minutia of the Leviticus sacrifice and purity laws to the Big Ten of the commandments that we heard today. That's how they were all supposed to work. They were a gift to the people to make their relationship with God better, to make their relationship with God right, and their relationships with one another better and good. As it says after the fourth commandment, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. That was the whole idea. Now Jesus gets to this temple and he sees the cattle and the sheep and the doves and the money changers and he, he busts their operation up with a whip of cords. And the other three gospels, this cleansing of the temple scene, as it's usually called, happens right before the crucifixion. But John's gospel places this scene at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, at the time of Passover, to lift up something important about who Jesus was and why he had come. Jesus was there to fulfill the law, all the laws, and change the way that God's people encountered God. The original gift of the Torah, the laws, instructions, commandments, had gotten warped and distorted over the centuries. It was a for-profit a for industry now. It wasn't just so that the priests could keep some of the meat from the animals sacrificed to have something to eat and live on. Uh, it was now so that the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the whole temple economy could prosper. So Jesus gets in there and flips the tables and drives out the animals, pours out the coins. Stop making my father's house a marketplace, he says. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. The temple leaders understandably say, why are you doing this? Give us a sign. Explain yourself. And Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They don't really buy it. They, they don't understand that he was really talking about the temple of his own body dying and being raised. And no one understands until later, after the resurrection. What Jesus was really doing, that, that they couldn't see right then, this, this disruption of the temple, of the marketplace. What he was doing as Passover was nearing, this commemoration, was something much bigger than just cleansing the temple. It would change everything. Passover remembered how God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. That's how the commandments start, too. Guiding them safely through the dry land, between the parted waters of the Red Sea. 
and then place them on the path to the promised land. Passover told the story every year of how the people prepared a lamb and unleavened bread and ate a hasty meal ready for flight. Passover told the story of how the blood of the lambs on the doorposts and the lintels signaled to the angel of death to pass over the houses of God's people, visiting the tenth and most extreme plague on the Egyptians instead, pushing Pharaoh to finally release the people. Jesus arrives at the temple as Passover is nearing to signal that he will be the lamb. His blood will free people, not from slavery in Egypt, but from slavery to sin, something completely new. A different Jewish holy day, Yom Kippur, involves goats instead of a lamb, but Christians see Jesus as fulfilling this role once and for all too. In Leviticus 16 and 23, it is decreed that the 10th day of the seventh month shall be a day of atonement. That's what Yom Kippur means, atonement or at one meant an annual sacrifice of special significance to cover not just the sins of impurity of the individuals, but the sins and impurity of the community, the whole of God's people. One goat was sacrificed for the impurity of the people, and the other had all the sins of the people laid on its head and was sent out into the wilderness, bearing their iniquities away. Jesus comes as the Passover lamb. Jesus also comes as the scapegoat with all of our sins placed on his head. Jesus's blood becomes the once and for all sacrifice and it changes everything and it saves us. It is no longer about what we do, you know, though keeping, whether it's through keeping commandments or making sacrifices, it's not about us making things right with God. Jesus says, I will raise up this temple, my body given for you. God makes things right with us through Jesus. It's no longer about what we do to make things right, the commandments we follow, the sacrifices we make. Jesus fulfills the laws and the commandments. Jesus becomes both the priest making the sacrifice and becomes the atoning sacrifice itself for us. Jesus makes things right for us. In most sermons, I try to tie the message into our daily lives. I, I'll try to lift up some concrete examples or some tendencies we have in our hearts. I don't have as much of a tie-in today. I just really want to make sure that you all hear again and again that when it comes to God's love and salvation, it's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus does for us. If it is about what we do, then there will always be imbalances, well-intentioned systems with grace built in that get warped into temple marketplaces and for-profit transactional conditional love. There will always be lingering questions about whether we sacrificed enough, followed all the rules, did all the required things. Jesus comes to reset the system and to bring us back from transactions to relationships. It's like the difference between a to-do list and a love letter. A to-do list isn't a bad thing. You get things done. You accomplish tasks. You make your world better. A set of rules hanging on the classroom wall isn't a bad thing. It keeps order and fairness going. But there's so much more to God's love for us than just rules and checklists. God loves us so much that Jesus died to save us, to cleanse our temples, to pass over our sins, to carry our sins away. It's not about us. It's not up to us. It's about what Jesus does. And then we respond to that. I know it seems foolish. I know that on some level we think we must have to do something, right? What's the catch here? We want to be the heroes of our own story. We want to be able to say that we did right, and maybe even what others did wrong, or not enough of. We tend to make our relationship with God and with others more transactional, like, like the scales on the money changers tables. However, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Why would God make his only son into the atoning sacrifice, the Passover lamb, to be killed and descend to the dead? Why? 
It does seem foolish, but God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Jesus fulfills these laws once and for all. And now anything we do, any offerings we make, any good works we carry out aren't to get in good with God or to avoid punishment or to balance the scales. They are solely in response to God's love and salvation for us and for the love and service we have for our neighbors. Anything we now do for God or in God's name is simply our reply to the love letter God sent us through the cross and the empty tomb. Because everyone should know about this love God has for them through Jesus, the Lamb. Now, before I close, I do want to say this. I need to say this. Please don't hear this contrast that I'm lifting up today as a, a condemnation of Jews or Jewish laws or Jewish practice. Our Jewish neighbors have a much more rich and nuanced relationship with God than what's described in John's gospel or than this simplified contrast I use to make my point. If anything, that's one of the main things I learned from the Bible study I led on Leviticus. What I thought would be an antiquated set of weird rules taught me a lot about God's love. It's just different. God's covenants with the Jewish people have never ended. And my interactions I've had with rabbis and folks of, of Jewish faith and practice have taught me a lot. The to-do lists are there alongside the love letters in the Bible. All of it are different ways of showing God's love for us. So just remember this. God is the one sending the love letters. God is the subject to all the verbs when it comes to our salvation and life. God is the one who gives us structure and rules so that our days are long. God is the one who makes the sacrifice to save us. And God is the one who takes our sins away. God is the one who cleanses our temples and resets our waywardness. It's not ever about what we do. It's always about what God does. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is new for the folks at Messiah, I believe. It's written by Pastor Susan Briel, who is wonderful and amazing. Uh, she filled in for one semester at seminary while our normal worship teacher was on sabbatical, and I've I had a chance to meet her and see her at Senate Assemblies. She's delightful, and the words she puts to music in our liturgies and hymns are always profound. So this song is called Holy God, Holy and Glorious. There's five verses. If you don't get it the first time, you got four more chances. Behold your wisdom. 
And we behold you living. Please join together with me in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church, that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering, especially those we name before you now. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for Perpetua, Felicity, and all the martyrs whose witness reveal, reveal the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, you are life. We pray for our world, our country, our community, and our church as we face the challenges of coronavirus. We pray for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, for the sick and their families, for those fearful of an unknown future. We pray for the millions of unemployed, for children and others at home, that they be safe from abuse. We pray for those who are alone and isolated during this time, that they may feel your loving presence. We pray for all the hospital and healthcare workers and all first responders, that they receive needed supplies and be kept protected in the work they do. We pray for those making decisions about how to live into the future and when that will happen. Keep us all in your care as we wait for a new day. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of all families, you have given us families to be sanctuaries of blessing, comfort, and love for each other. Under your protection, fill us with harmony, hope, and health. We pray this week for the Schroeder, Schwartfeger, and Shaw families, as well as our Messiah family. Guard all of our hearts that we may display love instead of hate, anger, or bitterness. Lead us all to be grateful for your abiding love and enable us to glorify you by sharing that love with others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is normally the time in the service where we share peace and share offerings. So I do invite you to share 
God's peace with those around you in your household, uh, in your uh, circle of friends and family, through whatever means you can do so, and into the world of, around you. And also to continue to share your offerings. Thank you for your generosity and consistency through this past year. Uh, continue to please uh, bring those offerings to our Sunday parking lot services or send them in through the mail or electronically. It's keeping our ministries going until we can really get going again. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending song is called, Lord, Take My Hand and Lead Me. Lord, take my hand and lead me upon life's way. Direct, protect, and feed me from day to day. Without your grace and favor, I go astray. So take my hand, O oh Savior, and lead the way. Lord, when the tempest rages, I need not fear. For you, the rock of ages, are always near. Close by your side abiding, I fear no foe. For when your hand is guiding in peace, Lord, when the shadows lengthen and night has come, I know that you will strengthen my steps toward home. Then nothing can impede me, O oh, blessed friend. So take my hand and lead me unto the end. Thank you for watching. Thanks for being a part of this time of worship. Uh, please look out for each other. Uh, we're getting close, but we're not there yet. So keep doing all the things we need to do, like this right here, uh, to keep each other safe. And make sure you check on each other and love each other in all the ways you can. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.